thankful for you, God. Thankful for our second chances. Jesus, you are the fire, a burning fire. It's you, God, it's you.
but let's bind a critical spirit right now and start singing. There's no wall you won't kick down for them. There's no lie you won't tear down for them. Let's go back into that. Start singing that over your brothers, over your sisters, over your nation. There's no lie you won't tear down for them, God, for that prodigal, for that one that you're coming after. Come on, let's sing that again, Olivia. Sing for them, for them, for my nation, for them. Take just a moment and share a couple things. I'm going to get right back in. It's just a real sense, the presence of the Lord. And that's all we really want. That, the, the goal is His presence. In fact, Margaret, she's not here this morning, but she, sent a, uh, she had this encounter where she saw Bob Jones laughing. I'm going to try to get it right. But anyway, the Lord asked him in this vision she had or whatever it was, what was the goal or what was the purpose? Why was the gathering here? And uh, he responded, to host your presence. She sent that to me uh, early this morning in the we I don't know, I just saw it. And, uh, but that is really what we want to do. That's the ultimate goal. Um, there's two things I want to just share quickly, and then we'll continue to worship. But um, someone sent with me a, um, a video of Joe Sweet. You know, he's the pastor in Lancaster Pennsylvania, uh, no, Lancaster. There's a Lancaster, Pennsylvania, California. And uh, he was just sharing before the conference they recently had, and he was challenging his people. But something that happened in their congregation, and then another congregation caught wind of it, and they did it, and the glory of God. So anyway, they shared with me, and it would just seem to fit. And what he said was, he was using the scripture out of uh, Second Chronicles, where remember where the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And they could not even minister. The priests couldn't even minister. We long for that. That's one of the promises of this place too. That, the, that His presence would be so overwhelming. We couldn't carry on with whatever, whatever was on our minds at least. But, but uh, the priest, you know, the Lord challenged Joe to go back and read what happened. The priest had to sanctify themselves. They had to spend time in the holiest of holies before they gathered together where the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. That's the ultimate. But they had to make preparation. And so he just challenged his people. He said, look, next Sunday, let's get here on time. They're probably like us. Folks get here, you know. We start at 10.05. You know, we really, we're going to stick with that. 10.05. I don't know why. 10 it could be 10.04, 10.06. But we want to start at 10.05. But anyway, some of them over there in California get there at 10.20 and 10, you know, just like that. And uh, so he challenged them, get here on time. But... Spend time with God in the morning. Get up next Sunday morning, 15, 30 minutes early. Get in the holy place. Spend time repenting. If you've been critical, judgmental, repent. You know, spend time in repentance. And then come to church next Sunday with your cup overflowing. Rather than just coming to get filled, you know. I mean, 
you know, we want to get filled, we want to be ministered to, but what if we just came already filled, already, you know, you couldn't do anything. Church, I mean, what are you going to do there? God's already, you get in His presence, what's church going to do for you? You know what I mean? But then when we come here together, we're all filled up, and then see what God will do. And if we could come in unity, then the glory of the Lord would fill the house of the Lord. How many of you are into that? Uh, you'll say, I'll accept the challenge. And you watching, you didn't make it this morning, you accept it. Next Sunday, 10.05, spend time with God. Get ready. Come having already entered into the holiest of holies. Well, you were into You guys are hungry. I heard they had a meeting here Monday night. We were away, and it went to midnight with your dad. This is amazing. They said the parking lot was full. This is the kind of stuff they're going to write about one day, but this is good in that testimony. But I need to share one thing. We need to pray. Um, some of you, we, we sent out as a part of the presidential prayer watch a short little clip. Oh, back up, one more thing. We're going to send the video of Joe Sweet this week to everybody. Okay, we're going to send it out Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. We'll send that out so you can see actually what he was talking about. It's only like about 10 minutes long. But the other video had to do with the presidential prayer watch and what was going to happen. Um, Kilpatrick, John Kilpatrick. How many of you know of him? And I was able to speak with him on the phone this week, and we were down that way. But, but he preached last Sunday, and God had spoken to him regarding the president. And so this is why I got wind of it, and I was able to speak to him. But he said that you have dealt with Ahab, but now Jezebel is arising. And that the Lord told him that they will try to, Jezebel will try to take him out. And then he challenged the people. And this is why what caught my attention. We know this. We've been praying. But he said, watch the news this week. The Lord told him, watch the news this week. What happened on Monday, the very next day, is when the, all of these things begin to break out. And uh, as I was speaking with John, he said, would you guys pray for me? Because he's talking about the deep state. We talk about this stuff all the time. We're not intimidated. But some people, you know, maybe they're just realizing, I don't know. But he said, pray. So we're going to pray for John Kilpatrick because when you step out on the front line and he has a much larger voice, you're going to get, you, you know, Jezebel is nothing you want to play with. Leviathan, that word over in Isaiah 27, we were reading that this morning, how the Lord would draw his sword and he would come and cut off Leviathan and uh, out of the sea of humanity. Well, Leviathan, Jezebel, the devil, I don't... They have various names, but the goal is the destruction of the nation. Now, that's why we have this presidential prayer watch. And uh, so we've got to step it up, and we've got to be strong, and we've got to be bold in this hour like we've never been before. I got up this morning, and I heard the word battle station. Battle station. Listen, you can be a little Christian and do a little thing and be a little bitty whatever. But listen, we're called to be an army of God. And so we've got to go after this thing. We've got to trust God. We've got to pray His Word. And then He directed me. Let me share something quickly. I'm not the speaker today, okay? We've got a dynamic, powerful, and I'm going to wait and introduce her in just a moment. But look with me, if you would, quickly, Isaiah 59. I'll just point this out. There are just about five things. And then we're going to pray. Then we're going to receive our offering. And, um, but I tell you, and try not to be political. Is our president a perfect man? Absolutely not. He's, you know, he needs to call on God forgiveness. There are past sins. How many have past sins in, in your life? Okay. You know, the wage it all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so he's no different. He just comes short of the glory of God. But God raised him up for such a time as this. We were heading down a road we would have not returned from. But God intervened. And God raised him up and gave the church the opportunity to do the will of God in America and to encounter what I believe is happening now, another great spiritual awakening. So anyway, this is, a, this is God's love for America, and He loves us. So anyway, Isaiah 59, remember the Scripture. It says, you know, that when the enemy comes in like a flood. I've heard charismatics in the old days say, well, that's really says when the enemy comes in like a flood. The Lord will raise a standard. That's not what that means. But it, it's okay. It doesn't matter how you interpret it. The enemy's coming in like a flood. A flood of words. A flood of lies. A flood of deception. You name it, the flood, it fits in there. But God will raise a standard. Now, what's the standard? 
That's what they don't tell us. Okay, God's going to raise a standard. What do we do? Just sit there in church and wait till the standard's raised? No. We got to know what the standard. So you just read the Bible. Read the verse 20. It says, the Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression. So number one, the standard is redemption. The power of redemption and the power of repentance. The answer for America is repent. Turn back to God. Turn to Him. He's our hope. So that's number one. Okay, that's the standard. Number two, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. Secondly, it's His promises. The standard is the promise, the covenant that God has with us through the shed blood of Jesus. You have to stand on the Word. You don't just stand in the pew. We stand on the Word, on the promise of God. God is not a man that He should lie. And we stand on that. And then number three, and my Spirit who is upon you. The standard is when the Holy Spirit is poured out from on high. That's what we've been talking about around here. The Holy Spirit comes in you. He's with you. He's to you. He comes upon you. And God, boy, does He know how America needs a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this hour. Upon the churches of the land, the churches will erupt in glory when the Spirit of God fills the house of the Lord. Anyway, that's a bunch of it. And then He goes on, and my word. Now watch this. My words which I put in your mouth. What does that mean? We eat the word? Well, it's part of it, but it means you speak God's word. You can't just, you got to speak it. You got to speak the word of the Lord. I so appreciate John Kilpatrick speaking the word. When you, I'm, you need to go see that video. It's only like three minutes. It's just very short. And then he gets his congregation to pray. And then at the end, he says, now watch the news this week. The Lord said, watch the news this week. When something, when somebody prophesies and what they prophesy comes to pass the next day, I listen. Especially if it's rooted in the Word of God. But anyway, you have to speak the Word, sing the Word, stand on the Word, prophesy the Word. It's not your Word, it's God's Word. Speak the Word. That's why we, we don't have a choice and we're going to. And uh, the church in America must catch this. And then, the, you know what else? Chapter 60. Now, some people may say, well, how do you know that chapter falls in place after verse chapter 59 because I can see it in my book it's in the Bible I don't know in history maybe that chapter was written all I know it the next verse says arise and shine and so the standard is the church arising and shining with the glory of the Lord upon them that's how a nation is saved in about six simple things and only God can do it. Let's stand for a moment. I want us to pray. Our president needs a lot of prayer right now. All of hell is assigned against him. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. How many of you could stand if the biggest demons in hell were at your door every single day? Every day. Every day. Criti many in the church are cursing him. Along with the world. Cursing him. So we need to pray because we've already got the word in this congregation. If he's removed, the grace will be removed and God will hold the church accountable. And he's, we're not, we ain't going to have it. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Not on our watch. Not until God, because there's a, the, not only the soul of a nation, souls in this nation are at stake. God so loved the world. And he's come. So, Lord, we pray right now, God, for our president. You just pray out loud. Let's pray. Pray. Father, we pray for our president. You said pray for those in authority. And we know there are many that didn't vote for him. Who gives a rip? He's in that position right now. And, God, we desperately need him to stay the course. Our economy needs him to stay in course. Our nation needs him to stay on course. Lord, we ask you. You said, God, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you would raise a standard. So, Lord, we are arising and shining. God, fill the house of the Lord with the glory of the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, upon us again with a fresh outpouring. God, we pray that the word of the Lord would be trumpeted across the land in this nation as never before. God, we know many are falling asleep. Many are falling away. But let many rise up in this hour declaring the word of the Lord unashamed, unafraid. Filled with the fire of God. We believe you for this stuff, Lord. 
And God, we just pray. We thank you for your promises to our nation, your promises to our forefathers, your promises to our great-grandmothers that prayed on their knees for America. God, we thank you that the Redeemer is the answer, the redemption. Lord, we pray for repentance, the spirit of repentance to sweep America. God, it's not too late. We speak to you. You told us it's not too late. But we want to trump it back and say, God, it's not too late. We thank you that you're a good God. And now, Lord, we pray every tongue that is risen in judgment, CNN, MSNBC, every tongue, every senator, every congressman that rises in judgment, you said shall be condemned. And so we speak that they shall be condemned. And God, you said this is the heritage of the saints. Not a bunch of wimps, but the saints of the Most High God. So Lord, we ask for their souls, but we ask you, God, let another man take their office. Lord, rise up in this land. Let the fear of God pass before them. Get their attention that they would turn to you before their soul perishes, we pray. And we thank you for it and trust you for it. You know, we live in a day that there are people taking hatred to their grave. You know, some of you know what I'm talking about. A man just died. He took hatred all the way to the grave with him. Anyway, what a day we're living. God, have mercy on America. But thank you. We're the church of the Most High God. Yeah. Amen. And listen, we have some amazing people that, are, that God has moved to Moravian Falls over the years. And Rich and Mary Haas are two of those. And uh, Mary is... She uh, has her testimony is absolutely incredible, but uh, she's being used of God. She just finished a book, and there's a workbook, The Healing Journey. And uh, God uses her. She's spoken in conferences in many places, but she's part of our church. This, just, this is amazing to me that God would have so many people that he's using in such powerful ways, living in just a short little bitty area of Moravian Falls. So anyway, would you welcome Mary Haas to us? This morning. And also, she has some of her books are out in the foyer, okay? Some of her books are in the foyer, so please pick them up on your way out today. Thank you. Thank you. One of those is the large print edition. <laughs> so Monica has them in the bookstore. I just want to honor the presence that's here. Father, we honor that your presence is here. We thank you for your presence. I'm just going to sing in the spirit for a moment because we want what Holy Spirit wants. Come Holy Spirit, <laughs> come Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. We just want you, Father. We just want you, Father. The Lord told me if I would write the book, people would live and not die. I said, well, that's not pressure. <laughs> I've been working on the book for about five years when he spoke that. So we, we got serious and obedient and finished the book. And the reason I wrote the book is I had 21 key conversations with Holy Spirit on how to get breakthrough. In 1998... Y'all don't mind Holy Spirit because he certainly doesn't mind to mess with people. <laughs> In 1998, 
I was struck with a form of muscular dystrophy and I lost use below my knees and then I lost use of my my hand my thumbs which is getting losing use of your hands I think David preached about how they would cut off the thumbs of kings you know when they conquered kings because then they could never hold a sword again so losing use of my thumbs stopped my life I mean it, it about stopped me completely and rich and I had five children and he became Superman as my friends nicknamed him because he took care of me and five children he's faithful kind man and when that disease struck six months prior I had said something to the Lord I should never have said because my heart got wounded in a church and I took offense and I didn't run into the father to get healed I went inward and I stopped talking to people and we all have moments where we get wounded we all have moments and and if I stopped and asked you your story you could tell me a place where your heart was broken but it's what we do with that brokenness that determines the future and in my brokenness, I said, Father, why is this happening to me? And he said, well, what have you prayed? I said that my eyes would be your eyes and my lips would be your lips and my hands would be your hands and my feet would be your feet. He said, why are you surprised? I said, what are you talking about? He said he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And I said, well, then I can't do this, this thing. <laughs> I just want to sit on the back row of a church. I just want to be saved. I can't keep flowing in the gifts of the Spirit and be this despised by people. And Holy Spirit backed off of me. It was a, it was a bad conversation to have with the Lord. Six months later, in one step, I was paralyzed below my knees. And I had battled this disease earlier, which was a miracle. I had walked out of it the first time. And I knew in that moment what had struck me. And instead of saying, oh, no, oh, no, I went, it's back. And what we speak out of our mouth and what we agree with, because all of us are getting hit with things. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. It is a daily choice what agreements we are making with things that are hitting our hearts, things that are hitting our spirit, things that are hitting our body. Well, not walking and talking with Holy Spirit, which I had done since I was seven years old, became incredibly boring. I did not know life could be so boring. And so I said, oh, Father, I, I should never have said those words. I have never been so bored in my life. And those of you you know who walk and talk with holy spirit it's just life like like you know you know to change a lane in the highway and you don't know why you just you know holy spirit says it and then you go a little further and there's like a tire laying in the lane like holy spirit is your best friend i mean he he's the one who is our teacher so Holy Spirit let me hold on to that pain and, and he will let you hold on to all the pain and traumas from your life because most of us just kind of step away from it. We just kind of, mm, we turn this way, which is, you know, what I did. And this was 1998 and in 2004, because I had shrunk two inches because I couldn't walk, so my bones went into an atrophy or not atrophy, the muscles went into atrophy, the bones went into osteopenia, I lost density. So I was shriveling, <laughs> I was in pain all the time. I was so stressed out that I could not, like grocery shop, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't walk that far, I couldn't do all that, that cluster migraine set in because I began to self-despise. And there are places in all of us that we don't like. And that's my message today about making peace with our own hearts. And so I began crying out to God, please let me die. My husband is good looking. <laughs> he will marry so fast he'll make heads turn and somebody can come in here and take care of these children. 
And I beat myself up that I was not the wife and mother I had been before this disease struck. And luckily, Holy Spirit did not answer that prayer. And so Rich said, the few muscles you have use of, I want to put an addition on our home and put in a small 8x14 endless brand swimming pool so you can push a button, create a current, and you can at least have some exercise against water. And he described it to me, and I said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> and uh, one day he goes, I have found a pool, and on Saturday there is a test swim, and you and the children will get in that pool. And I got in the pool, and the weightlessness and the, a little bit of the pain let up, and I could actually walk because the water was holding me up. And I looked up at him because he didn't get in, and I said, I want one. And he said, I know you do. <laughs> and he put an addition on it. It took him three years. And the day he finished the pool and got it up to temperature, everything was done. He said, tomorrow the temperature will be warm enough. You can get in. And I took my Bible out there. And this is the Bible I had that day. And I set it on my lap. And, and I'm very much like a child before the father. Either ask, you know... Anyway, I let it fall open, and it fell to John 5, and it's about the man at the pool of Bethesda. So I read those eight verses, because Jesus shows up, and he says he, know, he knew that the man had been infirm for 38 years, and the man watched for the stirring of the waters, because the angels would come down, and whoever got in the pool first would be healed. And I read the eight verses... And Holy Spirit said to me, what do you think of that story? I said, it's nice. <laughs> he said, well, you don't believe it. I said, well, I've never heard anyone preach on it. I I've never heard mention of, you know, in a sermon about healing angels. And Holy Spirit said something to me that would change the trajectory of my life. He said, if that man wasn't seeing miracles, he would have gone somewhere else. And in that moment, the faith of God came into me. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you don't have faith in yourself for something, here it is. Get in the word. Read it out loud. Let the faith of God come into you. And in that moment, the faith of God came into me. And I looked over and I went, I have water. I, I, I want John 5 angels to come stir this water. And during the next two years, I'd get out there every morning and go spend time in the pool. Now the doctor said, do not swim. Your bones need impact. Walk in that water. Just, just walk. I spent hours walking and talking with Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit said, you need to invite Jesus into every room of your heart. And I said, well, that sounds really good. But I, I don't know what every room of my heart is. He said, it's every day you've been alive. Jesus wants to sprinkle healing to there's not one trauma left because that trauma in your heart that happened at that church and you didn't run into the Father to get healed created a landing strip and the enemy could land disease. Because when I said to the Lord, why is this happening to me? And he said, why do you think this is me? I said, what are you talking about? He said, look around heaven. I have no storehouses of sickness to give anyone. Well, that'll wake you up to the promises of God because we know them, we hear them, we read them, but there's a place in our heart that has to lock into that God is good and that he is for us and that he only has good for us. He doesn't, he doesn't have evil planned for us. But God is the great allower. And he allows people's choices. And sometimes those choices are evil and they're inflicted upon us. Because God has no robots. And so Holy Spirit said to me, you must make peace 
with four things. And this is key for every one of us. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. There will probably be things today that I will have to go to Holy Spirit and I will have to make sure that I haven't stored it and turned away from it. Like I keep having to present things to my Father so I no longer hide things from myself. And, and children, you know, God made a way so we could separate out as children if things were incredibly traumatic so we could survive. But when we grow up into God, we have to make ourselves available before him. And one of my prayers is weed my garden, Father. Weed the garden of my heart. Because we don't realize that when hurts come and we take offense and then those hardened places in us, and they may not show up very often. I mean, they could be really hidden, but we create idols in our lives to things as opposed to just serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we have to go, Father, show me, show me where I'm insecure. Show me where I'm not trusting you. Those idols have to be broken down. So Holy Spirit showed me there were four things I had to make peace with. Number one, everything I had ever done. And at that point in my life, you know, I, I wasn't making peace that I couldn't do more. I'd wake up every morning and go, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry I can't grocery shop. I'm so sorry I can't, you know, and I had this long list of what I was sorry that I could not do. And one day, Holy Spirit let me do that for years. He loves us. He will let us stay on our course. <laughs> and then we get before him and he starts speaking. And he spoke to me and he said, I wanted you to know my love for you apart from your giftings. And I looked down at my infirmed body and I said, you love me like this? He said, I love you because I love you because that's who I am. And some of you may have laid down some giftings like I did. But Papa's love for you never stopped. He cannot love you any more than he does right now. And he cannot love you any less than he does right now. He loves you because he loves you. Because that's who he is. So I had to make peace with everything I had ever done. Because the enemy knows just when to come whisper. Remember when you did? And I used to cringe. And I think, did anybody see that? Because when that whisper came, I was partnering with guilt and shame. I had to take all those things before the Father and say, Father, I'm sure I've repented over and over and over of this, but I want to repent for partnering with guilt and shame and not allowing your blood to do what you said your blood did and to when we are faithful to confess our sins, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then we have to step away from partnering with guilt and shame. And I was still partnering with guilt and shame over things that I had apologized and repented for over and over and over. But guilt and shame will literally wrap around you. And you have to take the sword of the spirit out and cut it off. <laughs> get happy <laughs> and get happy because now I can remember those things and I'm happy because the blood is enough but I had to appropriate the blood of Jesus to all those things that I was partnering with guilt and shame over and some of you have things from years and years ago that are haunting you that the enemy keeps replaying that scene, that video, that track. And the blood is enough. The blood is enough. I had to make peace with everything that I regretted that I didn't do. And, you know, as a parent, there are things you wish you could go back and adjust. And the enemy would love to torment you with that. 
or, or just from youth, you know, things you didn't do. Maybe you didn't go to college. Maybe, you know, you didn't, whatever, pursue your dream. You have to make peace with those things so they cannot keep tormenting your soul. You have to make peace with everything that was ever done to you. And that's a hard one because we have all been hurt. And sometimes we have to forgive that person over and over and over. And sometimes a different circumstance shows up and it looks like that one from years ago. And you realize, oh my gosh, I'm still hurting from that way back there. And it's like, Father, thank you for showing me this. <laughs> when things go really wrong for me, I go, and I sit with the Lord and I'm like, weed my garden. This is going really wrong. And I don't feel good about this. And this, you know, I'm kind of miserable right now. But what are you saying? And he will give me a word. And I'll realize how hard God had to work to set up those circumstances to touch a place in me that I didn't even realize was there. And once he showed it to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is my pattern. I said, wow, Father, thank you for that terrible circumstance that you would expose this place in my heart. You love me too much to not touch this broken place in my life. Thank you, Father. Give thanks in all things, for he works all things together for our good. And when I was battling that disease, he said, thank me for your feet. Well, my feet were paralyzed, so I had to wear leg orthotics which are, you know, those plastic braces. And I had to swing with my thighs, you know, because the lower legs didn't work. And so it was a little bit of a Frankenstein walk. And um, so I looked down at them and I said, why would I thank you for my feet? They don't work. He took me into an open vision and there were no feet. I saw two stubs. I've, one of my most freak out moments in my life is when in that vision there were no feet. And I drew my foot up and I went, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for feet. Thank you, Father. Oh, my gosh. Look at my beautiful, beautiful feet. While you are cursing your body parts that you don't like, no healing can come. Whatever you are upset with in your soul, in your body, all that self-talk of self-cursing blocks Holy Spirit from what he wants to do. My feet work, y'all. <laughs> you also have to make peace with everything that was not done for you that should have been. You may have had a parent that could never say, you've got what it takes. I love you. I am so proud of you. And that is a lifelong wound. But you don't have to partner with it anymore. The blood is enough for everything that was withheld from you that should have been given to you. The blood is enough. I love this church because I love the presence and I honor this worship team and what y'all are doing to go after presence. And I love that that word that um, Margaret had because it is about the presence. When we come into his presence, light comes in and darkness is displaced. Those places lodged within us. <laughs> Everything hidden comes to light. They come to light. We get to give them into Jesus. And that's why we take communion. It's the holy exchange. We give him all our sorrows. All the places we partner with guilt and shame. And, and I picture Jesus. And he's, he's whole. But I can see the marks in his hands and his feet and his side. And I picture my brokenness going into him. Into his hands. Into the stripes on his back. 
and he's smiling because the joy set before him took him to the cross. And guess what? I'm his joy. You're his joy. He willingly laid down his life because he knew it would restore us to first estate, to how he created Adam in the garden. That is the plan of God, that we walk with God, that we know God, that we journey with him from glory to glory to glory, and that we are ever changing, and that we are not taken out by any of life's circumstances. <laughs> the enemy hates laughter, y'all. <laughs> And this, this era we've moved into, this kingdom age, is an age of peace. And I was up early reading in Hebrews 4, and it says they could not enter the, the promised land because they, they, they couldn't enter into rest. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his less rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. In Revelation we read that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, which is a mystery but God never plays catch up to the enemy. He knew what the enemy was going to do. And before the foundation of the world, he already had the lamb slain. So the terminal of the blood of the lamb started in heaven before he ever created Adam and put him in the garden. So the blood travels a circular path. And you were in the Father before he ever created the world. And you travel a circular path. And in him we live and move and have our being. We are to be in him. <laughs> our life. What Jesus did through the blood, we have full victory. But until we go on the journey of the heart, we can't walk out of the stuff that has hit our life. And there are times we need to go and we need to ask someone to forgive us. There are times we need to go and interact, but there are times it's not safe. We just have to do it by faith with the Father. But it is a journey of the heart. And as my heart got free, the pain lessened and lessened. And that incurable disease lost its hold. Now, I, was, I told you that I wasn't talking to anyone because <laughs> I really went private. So I got in the Word because faith had come. And, you know, I'm reading and, you know, lay hands on, Jesus laid hands on the sick and, and they recovered. And you see where, you know, Paul laid hands on people and, and all these people are getting healed. And I'm in this private journey. And I said, Father, can, can I lay hands on myself? Will, will that work? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So I did this. I command every cell in my body to line up with the Word of God in Jesus' name. Some of you are on a private journey, and that is okay. Some of you are going to want to do what I did and just go before the Father. He wants relationship with you more than anything. And out of that relationship, 
where we get freer and freer and freer. We come to the place where we get to love ourselves. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might. And love your neighbor as you're commanded to love yourself. It is a command of God. And in the church, we're so good at loving other people, but that self-talk we have can be brutal. And we can look in the mirror, women, <laughs> and we can be brutal. But Jesus is in us. When we've invited him in, when we have repented of our sins and we've said, Jesus, come in. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again. And I repent of my sins before you come in and be my savior. And then we move into a place of come in and be my Lord. Where we go on this journey of the heart and he comes in. And when I look in the mirror, if any self-talk about anything comes in, I go, oh, no, no, no. I see you, Jesus. I look in my eyes. I see you, Jesus. You're in there. <laughs> and we've got this. You and I have got this. More you, but, you know, you're in here. So we've got this. We've got this. Whatever this is in your life, you and Jesus have got this. Some of my favorite words in the Bible are in Samuel, <clears throat> where David is sent to the front line to, with cheese and bread to go check on his brothers. Jesse has sent him the little, you know, barren groceries. And he gets there. And we all know the story because all the Philistines are on one hill and all the Israelites are on the other hill and Goliath of Gath comes out and he said, choose a man, let him represent you. And if, and if he kills me, we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. And day after day, this taunt, and it's what the enemy does to our lives. Day after day, he will taunt us from things we have not made peace with. And David shows up. And my favorite words, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to think he can defy the armies of the living God? Because God gave a covenant to Abraham and he said, I will be your God and I will multiply and I will do this and this and this. And Abraham didn't have to, have to do anything. This was an unconditional covenant. And he said, and the sign will be, you will circumcise in the flesh all the males. Well, when we ask Jesus into our heart, our hearts become circumcised because we're under the new covenant. Everything in the Old Testament foreshadowed Jesus coming. And David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And what he was saying is, I am a covenant man. And when you are in covenant, when you have asked Jesus into your heart, you are now backed by all of heaven. And he said, who's he? Who's he think he is? He's not in covenant. Whatever is coming against you does not have the power of heaven behind it. You <laughs> are backed by all of heaven. And as we get in this word, it's doorways into the supernatural. And I've been hanging out in Ezekiel 1, and Ezekiel says, And the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. That's a great one to hang out on. I was reading in Exodus this week, and it says, Moses and Aaron and two others and 70 elders went into the mountain of God, and they saw God, and they ate and then it repeats, and they saw God. I'm like, how have I never seen that in my entire life? How have I never seen that 70 plus went into the mountain of God and saw him? And I think 
Scriptures are being opened that have never been opened. And I believe y'all are having these encounters where you are seeing and experiencing him like you never have. Because it's like the day that Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. Enoch was one of those who was ahead of his time and walked and talked with God. We have entered into that kingdom in the earth now. We are to walk and talk with God. And this is our blueprint. Whatever is in here, we have access to. This is the permission. <laughs> and I was in worship one day sitting over here and, and Holy Spirit said, kneel down. And I knelt down and I went into a, a vision and, and galaxies appeared. And, and I like those. I don't know if y'all have had many of those. I like going into the galaxies. Wow. And these ribbons showed up and they flowed from the galaxies and they turned into a staircase. I actually painted it during the Bobby Connor conference. It's over there. And all of a sudden, this lady comes walking down the stairs. And I'm like, the spirit of wisdom. Now, Holy Spirit in these encounters, just you just know things. You just, you just encounter and you know. And I am awestruck because I've been crying out for the seven spirits of God to be upon me. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and especially, especially the spirit of the fear of God. And as, and Holy Spirit gave me that prayer that I didn't just think, oh, that looks nice. No, Holy Spirit said, begin praying this prayer. And he said, but especially that the fear of God would come upon you. And the fear of God led me into the love of God like I had never known. And the only thing I feared was that somehow I would hurt my father. He is pure love. He has eyes for you. Of pure love. And as I began praying this prayer and I would sit out in the woods because I'm, I'm drawn to the woods. You all need your secret place. And nature to me just speaks of all the goodness of God. And the marvel of God. And these colors would show up. And they would dance around all the different colors of the rainbow in one at a time. They weren't, they weren't dancing. They weren't in a rainbow, but each one. This color would come and it would dance and I would be, ooh. <laughs> Nobody was out there. Nobody could hear me. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> and I didn't have a name for them. And I'm like, wow, living colors. That's all I could call them. Until I discovered that it was one form that the seven spirits of God take. They each have a color. And it's the menorah. And I won't go into that, but thank you, Jesus, for the deeper things of God. And in Revelation, the first five chapters, it mentions the seven spirits of God four times. They're before the throne. They're right there. They're right there. There before the throne. So when that scene opened up in the stairs, and here comes wisdom down the stairs, I was undone. And then her hands were out, and she had a sword across her hands. And I'm gazing at this, and I feel Holy Spirit, because I'm a little slow on the uptake, and He nudges me. He said, Are you not going to go get your sword? Oh, oh, I get engaged. I get engaged. This isn't just the screen in front of me. I get to engage this realm. Well, a few weeks later, something happened at our house. Um, a conversation between my husband and my daughter and I. And uh, I felt like I got thrown under the bus, which is a rare thing. And I said, I'm leaving this conversation. I'm going into the bedroom. And I was mad. And... 
after doing all this processing and getting my walking back, I'm happy. I'm happy. I mean, I got my life back. I'm happy. But I still have my soulish realm that would like to take over sometimes instead of being led by the spirit. My soul likes to rise up. And I go in the bedroom and I'm thinking what I'm going to say to him when he comes through that door. And I'd never done that in my life, but I had planned it out and I could feel the anger. And Holy Spirit said to me, you need to take out that sword that wisdom gave you and divide your soul and your spirit. So I did a prophetic act. I'm like, okay, in the name of Jesus, I divide my soul and my spirit, which is Hebrews 4.12. I'm going to read that to you. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the minute I did that prophetic act, I went, where'd he go? Ha ha, I'm not angry. Do you know your spirit is never angry? It's never angry. Your spirit is connected fully to God. And that doesn't, I'm not talking about not having righteous indignation against injustices. I'm talking about my flesh rising up in a wrong way and being angry. And I was so shocked. I kept touching. I kept checking. Like, where, where did that go? Who knew that the word of God can divide my soul and spirit? I mean, I've read that how many times? But, oh, my gosh, the word of God divided and Holy Spirit says to me, now when your husband comes in the room, ask him if he'd like to watch a movie with you. I went, okay. So he walked in. I said, would you like to watch a movie with me? He goes, well, I'd love to. And the next thing Holy Spirit said to me was, and then go apologize to your daughter for making it about you, which is what my husband had said I had done, which I didn't think I had done, which is why I got mad. So she's at the other end of the house and, and I go into where she is and I said, excuse me. But I want to apologize to you if I made that conversation about me. And she said, well, you did. <laughs> Out of the mouth of two witnesses, a thing is established. I said, well, I am sorry. I want to support you. Whatever it is for your wedding that you need, I'm here to support you. She said, thanks, Mom. She got married yesterday. Ha, ha, ha. I don't have to live from my soulish realm. I can anchor into the word of God and make this my standard. That the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now weddings can be a little stressful. So see, yesterday I had to check in with Holy Spirit a few times and get his perspective. Because I had a few moments where I thought it was about me again. <laughs> and God in his goodness gave me a few perspectives. And I'm telling you, when you get Holy Spirit's perspective, what you are looking at, which is not Jesus, shifts. And you're like, oh, Father. Oh, Father. Do you all know it was like 80 degrees yesterday in August? Talk about a perfect outdoor wedding day because I had forgotten about the outdoor wedding day. Three days ago, I decided to check the weather. I totally forgot I should be praying for no rain because when you have an outdoor wedding, it's, it could be a disaster. <laughs> I just want to keep checking in with Holy Spirit. I just want to keep getting His perspective, Heaven's perspective because we are seated in the heavenlies. With Christ Jesus. We have access behind the veil. So this morning I got up early. I'm letting Holy Spirit be my alarm clock. It's like, when do you want me to wake up? You just wake me up. So he wakes me up and I just go sit. And he puts upon my heart Hebrews 4. And I just go read Hebrews 4. Because I want to live from a place of rest. The children of Israel could not enter the promised land because they did not know how to enter rest. So whatever your battle is, you have to stay in the seat of rest, seated with Jesus. Heaven is filled with laughter. 
There's a lot of activity going on in heaven. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We are not separated from them. There's such a thin veil <laughs> between that realm and our realm. So close your eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we all long to make peace with everything we have ever done. With everything we didn't do that we, we regret. With everything that was done to us, we want to make peace with. With everything that was withheld, we want to make peace with. Father, we invite you into every room of our heart that you would come and sprinkle healing, that there would be no landing strips left for the enemy to have any place to land disease or bitterness or torment or shame or guilt or all of the other. We want every landing strip to be closed up and covered by the blood of the Lamb. And I thank you, Father, that as I release again this prayer language that's carrying a frequency of heaven, Papa, that you're healing hearts, you're healing bodies. The cancer has to bow its knee in the name of Jesus. Papa, in the name of Jesus, inflammation that is wreaking havoc in bodies, Papa, has to bow its knee. Papa, you know what everyone listening and here needs. And we come together as one. Your word says, whatever we ask, believing. So we come, Papa, for a sovereign move of God. That you heal us. <laughs> that you transform our hearts. That we reflect the glory of God. That we stop all self-hatred. We stop all self-cursing. <laughs> and we become the most joyful overcoming, victorious, shining ones. Kunaso no ne mana se ne ne mono so kure. Ne ahe, ne ahe, ne ahe, ahu ahe, ne ahe, ahu ahe, ne ahe, ne ahe, ne ahe, ne ahe, To God be all the glory, all the glory, all the glory. We are nothing without you, Holy Spirit. And I would like Rich and John F. and Kim, we want to give you, if you need a mother's blessing or if you need a father's blessing, I just want to call y'all up and we're just going to give you a hug. Spirit to spirit. We just want, if you need, if that was withheld in your life and you just want a hug, a, a blessing, John F. and Kim are from Texas. They are our dear, dear friends who came in and have just partnered with us and loved our children during this wedding season. And my son's wedding celebration is tonight, so we probably won't hug for hours because this is wedding weekend. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to give one last quick testimony. We have five children, and, and one's been married for four years. And in November, I went to the Lord, and I said, you know those four children of ours that aren't married? Two are not okay. They're just not okay. Life is not okay for them. They need that person that I have prayed for since before they were born, since, you know, I carried them in my womb. They need them. 
And I don't know what you're going to do about it, but it's time. Because, see, I have access to my Father. The veil was torn. I can boldly come into the throne of grace <laughs> by the blood because He loves me. That was November. In December, our daughter met the man and she eloped in January and then had her actual wedding yesterday. So that was fast. That made my head spin. And then in February, my son was on my heart and I called him. I said, are you dating someone? He goes, yes. You are? <laughs> and he let me marry him in our front yard July 4th and then his big celebration. So we have the celebrations now that they both did kind of private this weekend. So go after God. Access the promises. Just say, Father, the veil was rent in two. I come by Holy Spirit and I come by the blood of the Lamb and I enter into my Father's kingdom and I remind you of your promises and these are the things that I petition you with and I cry, Holy, Holy, in Jesus' name, Amen.